Brace yourselves for the demographic tsunami that's fast approaching. This is The Focus Group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend, Tim Bennett, as always. FocusGroupRadio.com is our URL. Check us out there. You can also learn about TFG Unbuttoned, our earlier in the week or our Tuesday podcast, three stories, 20 minutes, you're in and you're out. It's for commuting. It's for working out. It's for it's for life in general, right? And a big thanks to our partner here on the Focus Group, Deep Discount. You can visit Deep Discount by going to our site, focusgroupradio.com, and clicking on the Deep Discount logo and start your shopping experience with one of our favorite media partners. They have got, I think because of Deep Discount, we Bob and I have to do our yearly like DVD purge. <laughs> purge. <laughs> yeah. Hey, before we get going, though, uh, or, or as we get going, I have a couple things for you that we came oh. in from some of our listeners. The first one, I think you'll get a real kick out of, Tim. So one of our listeners sent this in and says, I think John is going to get a real kick out of this. Um, and it's the limited edition Space Dunk Oreo cookie. Ugh. And it's like got this purple packaging. At the end, does, Am I re- looking at this on the screen correctly? It looks like it's pink and blue yes. uh, frosting in the middle. And there's something called the Galactic Cutout, like a rocket ship, whatever, and cosmic cream and popping candy. So I think there's something, there's a candy thing. Maybe Pop Rocks, and it looks like a trans packaging. <laughs> Do you remember Pop the, the Rocks? Light, blue, you yeah, the Pop Rocks. I'm guessing it is Pop Rocks, right? Cosmic cream something and popping Something that might react to, to water and make it sound like you're blasting <laughs> off. So this was the first one. Thank so you. So are these uh, a real thing? Yes. You. I went to the Oreo website. You can order it. It's a limited edition. It only comes, you know, I don't know. This is that smaller pack size. Remember we used to we, when we used to do the limited edition, it was right. the, like a square pack. I'm thinking of getting it. And I said, I sent a note back to our listener saying, this is really great. Thanks for thinking of me. Do you think that things like mint in box matter with food items? Like, do you get two packs and do you save one for? I don't think you do. You know, I, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of feel, I used to always check when we were live in studio, I would bring us in for the taste test we would do all the different oreos and we even had somebody at oreo send us remember on the qt mm-hmm. send us some new flavors however i i've kind of not even looked anymore i almost felt like they jumped the shark with this but i'm I, i'll look now again because i can't believe this oreo this uh, space, space dunk i'll have to look at that maybe you can only get it by ordering it that's or that's... maybe it's target only or sometimes it's uh yeah yeah somebody and asked me what thing... our favorite flavor was of all the ones we tasted did you have one I, wasn't it one of the maple uh, maple ones? We liked maple. I said I thought we liked, it, we liked lemon and we also liked birthday cake, but both of those had the vanilla cookie. That's right. That's right. And did so, we like the red, but did they do a red velvet? Or they did it? a red velvet and they did, a, and the mint one was always good. The mint mint with the I chocolate. I do remember lemon being our one of our favorites. Lemon was though. good. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them were well, good. <laughs> and if you tune into TFG on buttons, you'll hear about Tim's lemon pie. It's a it's a key lime pie recipe, but it uses lemon, lemon. instead of. And yeah. I want to know why more people don't do it. <laughs> Look, I'm getting ready to sell Bunky's ice cream. <laughs> I was going to say, should we have pies too? We can sell pies and ice cream. <laughs> and Tim, you're on the Bunky you're on and the Kate. I got to get them. She's like, no way. Will she make? I, I asked her. I said, could you make? Because she made us key lime ice cream that time, and uh, we were going to do ice cream sandwiches with graham crackers. We were all excited. She's like, nope, not in the ice cream. <laughs> she's not in the ice cream business. It's like, okay. Well, she, I'll but make could, it for you to enjoy, but I'm not doing it in mass quantity. <laughs> but you're on, since you're on, like you know, town council, you can like get us the permit to stand and. Oh, well, there'd I'll be no the problem getting the permit. Where are you going to get the? Who's going to be out there selling that stuff in 90 degrees? Get a little, right. get a little cart, I guess. Right. I, I, I could see up. myself starting the day and then like disgustedly, you know, eating it and then walking off the boardwalk. Yeah. There was a All little right, shop this, just as a sidebar. There was a little shop down here that was available, so we thought, oh, we'll get that, and we talked to a couple of friends. <laughs> And then she, she of course, did the math and brought us right down to, right down to the. To, she said, "Do you really want to be there Sunday morning at five thirty, heating up croissants for the people to come by and pick up, and working until seven o'clock on Sunday night, and working seven days a week?" And you know, she mm-hmm. went on and roasting chickens and steaming mm-hmm. lobsters. Like, no, but maybe okay. we call the shop nothing but lemon. It's a lemon, and it's random. It's a lemon pie, a lemon. 
Lemon cookies. <laughs> or you and I could dress real freaky and call it lemon tarts. <laughs> can be a... All right, wait. Before we go down the road too far, another listener sent us an interesting article or an interesting thing about... Remember we did two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, you did an article about gift cards. Yes. And how often money gets locked into them. Well, one of our listeners, Michael, sent me a note. and He said, John, just listen to the show about leftover gift cards with a few dollars on them. Here is how to pool them in one place on Amazon. He said, I did it and it works. So basically, if you get like those Visa or MasterCard gift cards, you know how you, right. you use them and eventually there's like 549 or 10 something. And if you, if you, I guess sometimes you can't get that money off of them unless you... If you don't know the buy, exact amount, yeah, which is Yeah, ridiculous. exactly. So right. he said there's a way to consolidate those gift cards and turn them into Amazon money by transferring it to your Amazon gift balance. He goes, first, go look at the exact amount left on your gift card. You could do that. You could flip it out. Like One of the most popular is like Vanilla Card or something. In your Amazon account, find gift card balance and click reload your balance. It's basically your Amazon wallet that you're transferring the money to. Type in the amount left on your gift card and click buy now. Then change your payment method and add it as a new card, a new credit card. Only things like the Visa gift card um, or the, the MasterCard work, not your Bed Bath & Beyond, they'll not. Then it yeah, asks the, the name bed, of the card. Bath and Beyond card. I had that one. Yeah, you can't. Well, <laughs> you're, nothing. Your S S S O L S O L. Shit out of luck. When it asks for the name on the card, just type gift card or whatever it says on the front. Then you enter your own billing address and add your uh, and place your order. I think that stuff doesn't matter. It just has to have it. it. It'll transfer the money to your Amazon balance, and you could use that. I thought it was brilliant, and I'm going to do it with two cards that I have. And so he, Michael, I sent him a note and I said, "Thank you for this. You're getting a pair of socks." Socks. So you couldn't, so if you had, you know, like you mentioned, five, six bucks left on a card. I ran into when I tried to use it at a grocery store, they said, well, I need to know the exact amount. I said, can't you just yeah. run it through and take yeah. off what's and, left and on it? Can it card tell you? Some of them do that, I thought, but I guess this is another option, which is smart. I guess so you, you check the balance and then transfer it to Amazon. Mm -hmm. And then since I buy so much from Amazon already, I mean, yeah. right? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, our listeners tend to know more than we do. <laughs> I'm so glad when they send us this stuff, too. I'm like, thank you. I didn't know this. So we have space Oreos, and we have um, we have gift card transfer to Amazon, which is super useful, right? Yeah. I think no, it is. It's a, great, it's a great idea. And last week, I was red. We were talking about it before the start of the show. One of our listeners had made mention on the Facebook page that I, it reminded him of the Seinfeld episode where there was the Kenny Rogers roasters, and the, the sign was going at the Jerry's place, and everybody was red. <laughs> so I hope I adjusted my camera better today. You look good. I don't know what the problem was. So uh, the show works this way. We do what we just did. We catch up, and we give you some banter and some new information. We do a segment called Caught Our Eye. Tim and I bring new stories that caught our eye to each other's attention. They're usually very different. Uh, then we have a business birthday, only show in the universe that does business birthdays, and then we finish up with a shop talk. And this week's shop talk is about a demographic tsunami that's going to be crashing over everybody and removing all the old guard. I'm All right, I'm, let, I'm, letting, the, <laughs> I'm letting my bias about this article show, so we'll leave it at that. But without further ado, Mr. Bennett, what caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. So I was reading over the weekend, and I came across a story, and I, d I didn't know what to think about it. And um, <laughs> Do you now know what to think about it? I, I certainly don't. But I, I do and I don't. And so I, I thought it would be good for us to discuss. So the headline is, I am absolutely Japanese. Ukrainian-born model sparks debate by winning the Miss Japan pageant, or as they call it in Japan, Miss Nippon pageant. So they said the face of Japanese beauty is now a Ukrainian-born model, at least according to pageant judges who spark debate, on cultural identity by naming 26-year-old Carolina Shino as Miss Japan last Monday. So she was born in Ukraine. At five years old, her family emigrated to Japan. She's fluent in Japanese, uh, but she looks like a typical, you know, white European. And But she says she grew up in Japan. She's uh, naturalized as a citizen, and she uh, speaks fluent Japanese, and she's very much uh, Japanese as much as anybody else. And they said that she's always her whole life faced difficulties being accepted because of her appearance. And she hoped that by her entering this contest, it would change minds. So they said, um, you know, Japan is ethnically a very homogeneous country with very low levels of immigration, which in recent, recent years has prompted authorities to push for more foreign residents and workers to help plug their aging uh, population gap. 
And uh, they said they've struggled to balance its conservative views on immigration with the need for new and younger workers because their birth rate is so low. And uh, so she she ended she entered the contest. She gets selected. Um, the debate happened to say, well, she's not really Japanese. They said she should not have been selected because she's ethnically not Japanese, even though she grew up in Japan. Some disagreed. They said about half and half it was whether she should have um, been able to win or not, and uh, regardless of her Japanese citizenship and so forth. So I, I often wonder, they said they questioned whether the, uh, the big question is whether someone without Japanese ancestry can represent the country's beauty standards. And they said that Japan's <laughs> beauty standards um, also relate to the spirit of harmony. And um, some felt that many people don't value Japan. And uh, so this is a problem. But uh, they felt that she did value Japan, but she still wasn't ethnically Japanese. And while racial discrimination is unacceptable, uh, they said they personally wish that um, the contest was based on standards of Japanese beauty, not Western standards of beauty. Mm. So this has been, you know, I, I heard somebody talk about this in relating to some other issues where they said, if you went to France and you became a French citizen, you're French, right? Um, but you're not really French. There and is, are you, the, that's the subtle layer, right? Right. But when you come to the United States and you become American, you're an American because we are this melting pot made up of, of immigrants. But in countries like um, Japan or even Norway or you know, places where Iceland, or it's very homogeneous, um, I guess it would be difficult. So I don't know what you think. There's a picture if you're watching the video of her. She's, uh, you know, as I said, Ukrainian born, looks, um, doesn't look Japanese, quote unquote, but she's with four other Japanese women. And so what does it mean to be Japanese? Is she, can she not be in the contest because she's not ethnically Japanese? Did anybody come down in this debate on one side or the other? Or is it, it just was about 50-50. Like, okay. Some people 50, said they 50, thought it was meaning, good. 50-50 okay. were pro, 50-50, you know, it was 50 pro against. It, there, there was no overwhelming one side or the other. They did say that this happened one other time that they had a, uh, 10 years ago, there was a woman named Ariana Miyamoto, and she became the first biracial contestant, crowned Miss Universe Japan, and also caused uh, quite a bit of controversy. She was half uh, African, half... Uh, Japanese. And there was a real problem. They felt, uh, the Japanese felt that she wasn't ethnically Japanese, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, um, it's an interesting thing because we don't, what does an American look like? Oh, that's the whole thing that's fascinating about this. Miss America can have a range yeah, you could oh, be Hispanic, oh. you could be Asian, you could be supposedly. Yeah, I mean, generally, generally they're yeah. mostly white white girls, right? Yeah. But we've had an awful lot of uh, in the years more diversity, particularly with African American and and with uh, with Latino. But I I thought about this with Japan, and I thought, gosh, it is kind of a. I guess it's a it's a change for them to try to say could could somebody that does not look, and you know, quotes Japanese ethnically be considered Japanese and win a contest or represent of, the country. Of course, another aspect to this that's sort of off the radar is how did she enter the contest to begin with? She you know, filled like, out all the, the paperwork. She's fluent in Japanese. She's lived in Japan uh, since she was five. Okay, okay. So she, for all intents and purposes, is, is Japanese. Japanese. In her mind, she's Japanese. She knows the culture. She knows the language. She knows the nuance. She knows everything. They said they equated a little bit. They said there had been occasions where there had been um, biracial uh, athletes that represented Japan uh, quite well at the Olympics and some other sporting, you know, global sporting events, and they've done quite well and uh, were accepted. But this is a case where the, the country's trying to get used to the fact of can we have people that don't look, quote unquote, ethnically Japanese represent Japan? But but be but say that they're yeah interesting. Say they're okay. Japanese. So I don't know. It's a it's a tough one, I think. I, I, I. It's what makes us very different, you know. Yes, I, I think yes, as, a, as a country, and we don't res we don't understand that sometimes. And and that and this really focuses or showcases that quite nicely, right? It's like yeah. a beauty contest where yeah. you would assume. <laughs> it's interesting. Good one. Yeah. So that uh, caught your eye. Well, mine could not be any more different, and it was brought to us by our friend Lauren, 
uh, from Deep Discount. You know, Lauren is a listener, and she also has a keen eye, and I think she also has our sense of humor. I'll put up the image here, and uh, you'll get where it's going right away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. For all our audio Stop. listeners, I'm putting up a picture of a Reese's pink heart, which they do for Valentine's Day. I never saw this. And the headline reads, I can't unsee this. Reese's <laughs> Valentine's Day pink heart candy. Basically, it's sort of in a heart shape, but if it's upside down, it's a ball it sack. Could be a, it's a ball sack. It could look like other things. So uh social media users are giddy to discover that pink creme heart gotta get these. Reese's peanut 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 butter cups seem to resemble a different body part altogether the snack size valentine's day treat takes the appearance of a dangling scrotum when turned upside down many astute sleuths observed Reese's thought pink hearts would be cute but i think they missed the mark on this one <laughs> the only better thing is if they did a couple of other colors <laughs> to the regular chocolate. Who th- who would have looked at these and thought this was a good idea? Can you imagine bringing this in? Right, you're on the line. Yeah, we're gonna do hearts. We gotta change. We gotta we gotta increase sales. We gotta you know expand the product line. We got a brand extension. We're gonna do hearts. Okay, we're gonna do hearts. And then you bring this into the meeting. Wouldn't the first thing you'd be like, it looks like a ball sack. A, a and A and A and A all over the li- like. The thing is, if you're gonna do a heart, you better make sure it looks like a heart. <laughs> Regardless of the direction it's well, in. Well, they right? needed to make it wider is what I think they needed. But my guess is by the way the packaging is, right? Because they didn't want to change uh-huh. the packaging. It's like trying packaging to all of a sudden make Doritos narrow. round, right? You can't so do it. So let's just make it heart-ish. So it needs to be narrow. So you couldn't make a big fat heart. That's Someone funny. says here. I got to buy these. Someone says, adding insult to injury, parent company Hershey boasts that these snack size <laughs> candies are perfect for dropping off at co-workers' desks. <laughs> Or for classroom exchanges. <laughs> the, the pink hearts, which fittingly contain nuts, were launched. Oh some my years God! Ago. They have nuts. Yeah, <laughs> their virility has recently taken hold. I um, oh I just God. looked so at this. So not only do they look like a ball sack, but they have nuts on them. This is great. It keeps getting better. <laughs> We've got to find these, John. Have you seen them? You got to look and see no, if you find these. No, no, but see, Lauren sent this to me, and it, she sent it. Um, as a text message and it was a picture and um it came via twitter and the minute i opened this up and started looking at it i thought exactly tim everything you just ran through you brought this into the boardroom what are we right. making we're making a heart making you know, hearts God, looks- for that time. oh wonderful <laughs> can i get a look at them <laughs> I mean, this is wait when have we uh when have we other what other candy and food fails have we seen like this well we though? saw the one where they were doing it was the um we we showed it actually on our when we were in studio it was on uh for um uh march uh, saint patrick's day and it was supposed to be a, a, a leprechaun with a pot of gold and the way the the rainbow came out into the pot of gold looked like a limp <laughs> penis do you remember that i don't know if you remember yes. that I remember this now. Oh my yeah. God! Another another <laughs> holiday food fail. But when you looked at it on the package, it was like these cookies with oh, it's a rainbow. But they, they, it was just a vanilla cookie or whatever that came out. It just looked like a big limp penis in the in the bag. I don't. Yeah, I I just laugh at these. Hershey just got in trouble for something else over Christmas, I believe, because they had had. To, I think it might have been in Canada. The package had all kinds of great imagery that they were supposedly printed on the candy bar of scenes or or but know. what the candy bar was just plain it right? was plain when you opened it up and everybody was upset and said we thought we were going to get these candy bars that were adorned with all of this you know color and 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 pictures and imagery but it was just the package <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lawsuit there's class action suit if you were you were you know you forced into buying this because you thought you were going to get some special looking candy bar but this one is great i i just i can't imagine <laughs> and what's the flavor? Is it peanut butter inside? Yeah. So it says peanut butter. Back. What does it say? I'm trying to read it. Peanut butter and pink. It says here, um, either way, it tastes like peanut butter and chocolate. That, yeah, that so it says peanut butter and, and rolled or something in pink cream. Peanut butter something and something. Yes, oh. you're right. It says peanut butter, peanut butter something in pink creme. Yeah. Oh, creme. I'm look sorry, creme. Too. So it's not cream. Look, so you know there's you know no milk. There's no dairy in it. It's creme. Why? What do you bet I can find this upstate at like CVS or something? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we should get a couple of these, and I'll send. Oh, if I you can't. don't find them, I'll you send give them to friends. 
You have a dinner party, put them out at the table. But put them upside down on the table. Just dessert, here's dessert. <laughs> Happy <laughs> Valentine's Day. <laughs> so I got to say, Lauren, Lauren earned her. Oh, Lauren, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah she's looking out for us finding these great things. So thank you, Lauren. <laughs> All right, that's uh, caught our eyes, you see. <laughs> They're very different things going on here, but are you ready, sir, for a um, business birthday? Sure. All right, let's launch into the business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. This one was picked for you, Mr. Nash, for the business Thank you. birthday. I knew that there was, a, we can talk, this is this is a good one, folks. Go on. So born January 31st, 1938, he died at 76, Stanley Marsh three. Yeah, I had to, Tim, I had to research that. When you sent me the notes, I looked at, I want, I thought, I wonder where that number three came from. I went yeah. on to Wikipedia. His name is Stanley Marsh. Marsh three. three. Right. He yeah. didn't like to use the Roman numerals for the third, but he thought it was too pretentious. So he just did three. He has a son, Stanley Marsh four. But <laughs> so Stanley Marsh three, he's an American artist, businessman, philanthropist, and prankster from Amarillo, Texas. He's best known for having been the sponsor and creator of the Cadillac Ranch. An unusual public art exhibit off Route 66, now uh, Interstate 40 west of Amarillo. Uh, his reputation, however, recently has been tarnished right after he died, right before he died, with uh, accusations that he had sexually abused teenage boys. But um, you know, aside I, I from love that, the way you, I love the way you kind of like. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, aside from boys. that, okay. So he collaborated with, uh, and, and John and I will tell you the story about uh, a little bit about the uh, Route 66 and uh, Cadillac Ranch. But they said in the 70s. Uh, Marsh had collaborated with the art group Ant Farm out of San Francisco, and he commissioned them to put together this Cadillac ranch. So they buried 10 Cadillacs of older vintage with their noses in the ground, the fins in the air. And uh, he, he said it, he did it because he wanted to match the sides of the Great Pyramids of Giza. <laughs> <laughs> that was the reason? That, yeah. Okay. All right. The Cadillac Ranch has been, uh, as it's been called, was uh, memorialized in the title of, Bruce Spring uh, title of a Bruce Springsteen song, all also became one of the country's most photographed roadside attractions. And uh, it represents, I said, Texas kitsch, consumerism, and the American reverence for the road. It's, uh, he said, uh, it was also, he said, a monument to the American dream. As a boy growing up, he said the car represented money, and it was also the first valuable thing we ever owned. The car also represented sex, and it was where you had dates. And a car, all, and the car also represented getting away from home. And so that's why he he loved to do the car, the car art, because of all those things. So sex, dates, getting away, wealth, you know, ownership, the American dream. So he said um, they actually moved in 1997. They actually had to move the uh, the Cadillac Ranch a little bit to get it uh, further as the road had expanded. But um, the cars have been taken care of. They've been painted different colors over the years. There's graffiti on them. And uh, Mr. Marsh says he loved it. And uh, he loved the fact that they just kept changing all the time. He also was involved in some other um, art installations and art projects. He made his money. He went to the University of Pennsylvania. He made his money in business and attorney. His family had uh, banking interests. So he used his money for these art installation things. He had something called the Dynamite Museum, which also consisted of a number of mock traffic signs. So all around different cities in Texas. And he only wanted to go to cities that had A's in them for whatever reason. I don't know. But <laughs> they said the C he, he would put up all these fake traffic signs in these cities that said road does not end. Um, Lubbock is a grease spot. Um, I have traveled a great deal to Amarillo and different things. He had these mock traffic signs. And um, again, he said he wanted to do them with only cities that began with an A, which I don't quite understand. He also did, um, they said they called a lot of his project eyesores. And uh, he had a lot of critics about the artwork he was doing. He said in response to his criticism, he was quoted as saying, art is a legalized form of insanity, and I do it very well. <laughs> you know, he often wore loud checkered suits, occasionally dropped water balloons from his 12th floor uh, office window. Um, he was a concoctor of public, of lots of public stumps. He kept a pet lion and he earned the name, uh, he earned a place on Richard Nixon's enemy list. And because uh, he wrote to Pat Nixon and uh, put all her hats in a museum, he was planning to, to dedicate it to decadent art. He once turned a football sized field uh, into a ranch, into a pool table. And I painted it green, had giant billiard balls and a 100-foot pool cue. 
He also had a colossal necktie tied around the chimney of his mother's house. In 1999, he disrupted a live television broadcast on the, the Weather Channel when he performed a Native American snow dance in front of the cameras. <laughs> It's quite the character, Tim. It's quite a character. So as I said, his family was in oil. He was an oil man. Um, they developed oil and gas properties in the Texas panhandle. We mentioned earlier he was the third person named Stanley Marsh. He didn't like uh, the Roman numerals. He thought they were pretentious, so he used the uh, Arabic numeral three. And uh, he died of, uh, he had some complications of uh, strokes. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, he went to... Um, he was charged with a number of um, sex abuse claims from from young boys, I guess, for lack of a better word. And so while he was also sick in the hospital with these series of strokes, these uh, lawsuits alleging sexual abuse of several underage boys had also surfaced. And uh, he died before he was able to clear his name. Of course, he said he didn't do it. Um, there seemed to be overwhelming evidence that, in fact, he may have been um, paying for sex by underage two underage kids. And um, but he died before being indicted and before serving any time for that. So he died in hospice at 76 years old. All right. Now that we know the creator of Cadillac Ranch, Tim and I ex kind of experienced Cadillac Ranch, right? Yeah. yeah. We were in. Um, was this after the uh, the um, barbed wire museum, the devil's right. rope. Right. Well, we were at the devil's rope museum and the next stop was going to be the Cadillac ranch. Cadillac and ranch. You and asked, I forget the to, woman's name. Yeah, to Ina. Was it Ina or? I think it was Ina or Ina. Yeah. You're Ina. Right. And she's like, mm, you're going to drive by it. And we're like, yeah, she goes, that's Cadillac ranch. <laughs> well, you said we're, we're on our way. And she says, well, don't miss the leaning tower of pizza, P pizza, yeah, <laughs> pizza, which she was confused with pizza. Mm -hmm. And she said it's in Britain, which was spelled B R I T T O N, T -O -N. Texas. Yeah. Just like the Leaning Tower of Pizza in Britain. And you're looking at me cockeyed. You're like, isn't it the Leaning Tower of Pizza in, Fran in uh, Italy? <laughs> that didn't matter. <laughs> and then you say, and we're laughing. You're like, what else should we see? And you, just, and you said, oh, the Cadillac Ranch. Have you been there? And she goes, I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you and I was pouring rain, remember? I think it was either rainy or something. We went and we're like, there it is. And uh, we didn't want to loop around because we would have had to make a U-turn and go over. It was on the other it, side it, of the road. It wasn't raining, but we did that trip in the middle of one of the biggest heat I thought waves. it was, okay, I thought for some it was reason the heat it was dome. raining. And, and we did go through a massive storm um, when we got to, uh, where was the end of the uh, the turquoise bear? Was Albuquerque. New Mexico. Yeah, was, was it Santa Fe? So it was because yeah, from Texas to there, we, we, you could see the storm miles yeah. away. And as we got closer and closer, it got blacker and blacker and then boom. But yeah, I couldn't this, imagine living there. I just remember driving in the cars, just seeing how vast it was. And I thought, and man, flat. Yeah. yeah, you could just see a storm coming and you can't get away from it. I mean, I thought, man, I don't know. They, I, I kind of wish we had video more of some of that trip. Uh, we took yes. a lot of pictures. We took a lot of pictures, but you know, Tim, when we did that, it didn't occur to us to do that on our phones. No. I don't even think we had the storage capacity. I, no. I mean, you know, no. later on, we did Ice Cream Trip. We had some video, but uh, yeah, no, especially like the barbed wire. Like there was Merrimack Cavern, Barbed Wire Museum. There's a couple of places that would have really benefited <laughs> by the, being the moldy bagels moldy. at the end of the Dove or wherever the hell we were, at the end of the bear. <laughs> Remember they said this the best the world. breakfast you'll ever find. You and I are sitting there, the mold all over the bagels. We're like, really? We'll that go was when else. they had to practically. We 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 stayed in two rooms. They probably never even opened, and they had a connecting Ooh, bathroom. That old TV sets. Dusty, I just dirty. heard Tim sneezing, and sneezing, <laughs> and sneezing. Because we dust. had stayed in great places. We stayed at yeah. uh, great Oklahoma places City, across the country. God. Oklahoma was unbelievable. Great hotel in uh, that kind of space age hotel in St. Louis. St. Louis, yeah. The one in Marietta, the Lafayette, not so much in Marietta, Ohio. That, that yeah, just, you were used to that. You knew what that which, was about. You, know, you get what you pay for. Yeah. And um, but yeah, we had some great, great hotels. But that that one at the uh, the end of the turquoise, whatever, was not uh, not as it was billed. <laughs> Petting the cat, you're like, stand up, stand up, stand up. <laughs> yeah, well, they were looking at you. <laughs> got a crack of my butt. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move along. To, Happy uh, birthday, Stanley Marsh three. Yeah, three, and who has a son, Stanley Marsh, four. 
Um, let's move along to what I teased at the beginning of the, uh, of the, of, of the broadcast today. And that is this, um, boo, 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 there we go. A demographic tsunami is coming for the ballot box as more Gen Zers identify as non-white and LGBTQ plus. Here's a quote that pops up in the article and they even use it in the subhead. It's over for white Christian male hegemony in the United States. The minute I read something like that, I kind of crinkle my nose up and think, really? Because they're they're fighting and kicking and they're doing pretty good at holding on. Anyway, a recent survey from the Public Religion Research Institute's PRRI has found that 28% of Gen Z adults identify as LGBTQ+, a massive leap from the 16% of millennials, 7% for Gen X, and 4% for baby boomers, and 4% for the silent generation that identify as such. The comprehensive study also found that 21% of Gen Z adults identify as Republican, and 27% identify, 27 identify as white Christians, making Gen Z more queer than Republican or white Christian. Took me a minute to parse and sort the numbers, but um, later on it talks about how a lot of people comment on this, and it's like, guess what? You know, we're coming, at, we're going to be coming, and it's going to change things, and, you know, it's it's a tsunami. And then mm -hmm. later in the article it talks about how this uh, this cohort, if you want to call it that, they're not really big on voting. So, <laughs> Tim, what was your uh, your take on this? Because you and so I look I, at research a lot. Yeah, I had a couple of takes on it. First of all, I I laughed over the, you know, it's over for the white Christian male, and uh, I thought really because we're about to anoint a rapist and an insurrectionist to be on one of the political parties to run for president, right? So, um, there, there's that. I also wondered in the beginning when you mentioned. Um, that 28% of Gen Z identified as LGBTQ+, and I thought, what's changed? So mm. does this mean that earlier generations are more sexually Open. fluid than, than has been reported? In other words, when they only say that 4% of boomers uh, and 4% of Gen X identify as LGBTQ, my guess is if, if I was a researcher, I would say the fact is what you're saying is 28% of all people because maybe those generations weren't comfortable with coming out or being who they say they are, right? So somebody at, at, in their 60s that all of a sudden decides that they, they want to live what their authentic self was, which they may have always felt like they were a man or a woman or that perhaps they had attraction to someone of the same sex, it wasn't as um, acceptable when you Correct. were of the older yeah. generation. So is in fact really instead of the boomers saying that it's only 4% that identify, is it really 28% like Gen Z because they feel more comfortable by saying it? So I, I, I said, you know, is, is it the whole population's that rather than just saying it's 4%? Because what would change between somebody that's 40, 50, 60, or, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 saying that they were LGBTQ? It's just acceptance of saying it, right? It's not that all Correct. of a sudden people have changed that much, have they? Yeah, and you and I, uh, Tim and I look at a lot of research for our clients. We conduct a lot of research. And I think, Tim, you you pretty much nailed what we've identified as a definite thing, which is even the comfort of telling someone in a research environment of your orientation. So if, you, right. if you're someone um, who was in your late 50s, or early 60s, your generation went through a whole bunch of stuff. And it wasn't cool to even let people at work know about right. your orientation, hence the lower self-identification number. When Tim and I used to look at data for our clients, it would often say 4%. Would, and we knew for a fact that it was probably more like 7 or 8% of the population. 28% is a really big leap. And I really yeah. wonder about one thing about all this data. It's, it's directional. It's not frozen in time. And you wonder if... Um, People's lives change, their approach to things change. So as they talk about the, LG, the LGBTQ cohort of Gen X, they're going to have their lives play out a certain way. And some may discover that they want to go back to organized religion. Some may change their political beliefs. You know, I, I just don't yeah. buy this whole idea that because of who they are and how they identify, it's going to be a tsunami at the ballot box. And then the, the whole research seems to be negated when at the end of the article they say they're not much into yeah, voting I don't I mean, vote. that's how you you know what i'm talking about <laughs> that's how you make change yeah yeah the other thing about this sort of um research because we've heard this over and over again from some some of the clients about oh gen z is the the the, the most diverse lgbtq blah 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 
It's you know, like, okay, they're the most diverse generation. Still 72% are not. Right? So <laughs> good point. Yeah. So if you look yeah, at the numbers, okay, 20, right? Right. 28%. Bah, 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 we gotta do this, we gotta do that, and your hair's on fire. Well, 72% is not. They kind of identify as general population. Yeah. So that's why I often, you know, you and I get suspect of these numbers, or you have to talk people off the you know, off the ledge because, you know, you and I if had one client, right. You and I had one client where there, all this research came in about, you know, majority of Gen Z identifies as LGBTQ. Not really. It's just the, a larger amount of Gen Z identifies as not the whole, you know, it's, it's, it was the way it was all positioned. And, uh, you and I just look at it and kind of scratch our heads about this stuff because when you look at the opposite of it, right. And you say, okay, there's 28%, but there's 72 that aren't. So you still need to sell products or you still need to reach that 72% that might mm -hmm. be Christian, that might be white, that might be Republican. And how are you going to change their minds? And uh, here's something I learned from working for Tim for many years. Um, at the bottom of the article, <laughs> this is something that Tim, and actually I think uh, Mahoney would do as well. One sentence. The survey included 6,000 respondents from across the United States. Right. Now, nowadays, wah, wah, wah. I, would, I would stare at that number and ask the research firm to tell me what percentage of that number came from urban areas, suburban areas, from the, and the different regions of the country. Because inherent in that number is going to be a bias, right? I mean, am I crazy about that? Or? No, you're not crazy about that. It's just, where did it come from? Who answered the poll? Who answered their phone? Was it at something done online? Was it, so if it yep. was done online, yes, there were probably weren't a lot of boomers that were online answering the question. And 6,000, I mean, you're, you're talking about, I mean, gosh, it's not even a percent of, not even 1%, it's not even a half a percent of the people in the country. Would you consider that a sample size that you could, you know, extrapolate from? Only if I did what you did. If I said, okay, this is because what's not answered there is it should have said survey included 6,000 blah, blah, blah respondents from urban areas, from top 20 DMAs, from top or that were across social media platforms, whatever it is, there's, there's no qualifier there as to where those 6,000 people came from. You could have just gone to a university, you know, yeah. with 60,000 kids and said, okay, fill this out and you got 6,000 responses and come up with this. So, yeah, I, you'd want to know the qualifiers as to where this stuff came from. But this is the sort of thing where a lot of times, particularly you and I have seen this with the LGBTQ consumer, a lot of these companies that put out all this information about the power of buying of the, of the mm -hmm. gay consumer of $900 billion and all this other stuff. And then when you and I start pulling the math apart, it's like, oh my God, you're not doing yourself any service here because... <laughs> You know, it's similar to Sirius XM, right? What was it that we've got 20 million, 20 million listeners that that's just, everybody's radios tuned into your show at the same time, at the same time, <laughs> there's the potential for 20 million. It's never going to happen, but there's the potential for 20 million listeners, but it's not going to happen, but that's how they would sell it. Right. Which, 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 uh, you know, smart people would question. So you and I were really in our serious days, you, you. I remember the math you used to do to get to our audience. Oh size. my God! I wouldn't call it tortured, but it was um, it was studied, and you had a methodology. There's that a was methodology, sound. whether it was right or not. Who knew? And but nobody did. They could get a Nobel Prize if you could figure out who tuned into <laughs> Sirius XM Radio. You win the Nobel Peace Prize. You get a Nobel Prize. You could. You right. could. Yeah. It was the same thing I used to say to the CFO at Subaru when you know why why we why we have an ad in the third quarter of the Eagles game. The game was over by then. Really. How many cars did we sell then? Right? I don't know. Of course, you don't know. It's 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 a collective effort. It's not one it's one ad on TV during the third quarter of a football game. You know, it goes back to all the old things we learned as kids, right? Uh, what was it? P.T. Barnum. There's a sucker born every day, yeah. right? Was it Wanamaker's? Wanamaker. The famous. To, yeah. You know, fifty percent of my budget's working, fifty percent's not. I just can't tell you which is which. Yeah. I, I waste half like of my that. money. Yeah, ha fifty percent of my advertising money is wasted, but I don't know which half. And that goes directly into your uh, second quarter or third quarter of the Super Bowl. We yeah. run at four, an F-150 ad. How many trucks did we sell? I, I don't, don't know. know. How are you going to know? <laughs> and yet, uh, you and I have sat in meetings where people said, this work that you're doing is so great, you better build another factory. Yeah, you're going to need good. another you're factory. You're going to get so many cars sold. Really? Look what happened to poor Volkswagen with the, uh, with the Passat. 
with the yep. Star Wars ad, right? It was the, the most watched Super Bowl ad ever. I think to this day, still day. the most yeah, the modern, Darth Vader ad. Right. The car, you know, the car was discontinued two years later because of lack yeah. of sales. So yes, they did a nice ad, but didn't mind, didn't mean people bought the car. So anyway, yeah, I'm going down the the old man. <laughs> I should have the uh, Andy Griffith song yeah. playing. Dun, 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 yeah. dun, 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 dun. That used to always do that to us when I would go off on my on one your of soapbox, my, my, one of yeah. my back in the days, and you would just let it run. <laughs> but do you believe these? So, so just to, I guess to wrap this up for you, do, do you agree with me that it's just simply that nothing's really changed with people? It's just whether people are more open about who they are. That would be I. I would find it very easy to support that theory that that you're not looking at a a size change you're looking at the ability to self-identify and comfort right. not necessarily the group's grown by leaps and bounds it's just now i can talk more freely about it right and so i i think actually that's a positive thing if you were an yes. advertiser or specialized in lgbtq plus marketing because there's a lot of people out there that would resonate with your message they just i haven't publicly said so but they may privately say so with supporting your product or buying your product or supporting your service. You know, so I Tim, think that that's is, a positive. I think that's a great positive, and it's such a different spin on that research as opposed to saying there's a tsunami coming for the ballot box. Yeah. You and I look at it for marketing and, and uh, advertising purposes as saying there's a far more receptive consumer awaiting your messaging if you want to take the time to tailor it. Yeah, I'm going to have to call the you. Biden campaign office, see if they need any help. <laughs> you live, Tim, you're down the block. You can go knock on the door if they let you up the path. I wonder if they'll let us do it. How much <laughs> you want to charge them? We got some info for you. <laughs> they got money, Tim. They, they uh, Money. I did talk to two young Gen Zs that were, uh, they were going to support Trump, mm. which was shocking to me because they did not fit any profile or any anything around Trump. But then exactly what you said, but it doesn't matter. I'm not registered to vote. I said, good. I said, don't vote. If you're going to vote for Trump, don't vote. But I'm but, not but, but they had all vote. these they had all these reasons about why he was a business. He's a successful businessman. The apprentice, the apprentice. Yeah. And I was like, no, he's not. But where do you go from there? No, no. And I loved Rudy Giuliani this past weekend. Just to, to close this one up, just he didn't rape anybody. He was charged with sexual assault. <laughs> I read it? that article. Yeah. I read that article. He didn't rape anybody. He was he wasn't charged read... with rape. He was charged with sexual assault. As if that's okay. Did you he also put his read fingers? That... He put his fingers in her in her in her hooter. Yeah. Did you also read that Rudy makes like two thousand something a month, and that he has three hundred and forty five? I forget the number. Is that his social account. security? Possibly, <laughs> and and he has millions of dollars, and and then he claims Where's that, that there's unpaid from? bills from. Yeah, from Trump. Where'd the, the millions people. come from, I wonder? Well, it wasn't he part. He's he's definitely part of that Dominion suit and also the Smartmatic. And then he No, was but I mean, held, where did he get all this money from? In the early days, it was from uh, his, Attorney, when he was an attorney. Yeah, wagon train to the stars when he was America's mayor. Oh, yeah, that's right. Probably and wrote it, was a the book. Two, it was the two wonderful election workers down south who successfully sued him for defamation because... He would utter these sentences, and suddenly people were mobbing them, or like you know, threatening yeah. them, and yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. Jeez, jeez. Anyway, well, thanks for joining us today here on the Focus Group. <laughs> Did you learn something today? Is uh, Reese's yeah, and you know. I love the Reese's. I got to thank you, Lauren. Um, yeah, thanks for spending time with us here today. Be sure to learn all about us at focusgroupradio.com. You can find all of our media house there, including our podcast TFG Unbutton which is released on every Tuesday, 20 minutes in and out, we like to say. Thanks to our friends at Deep Discount for supporting us. Thanks for Lauren for your good caught my eye this week for John. I can't wait to go look for them. I'm looking today for those. John. Yeah, you got If you go out on errands, you got to find I'll these. I'll get some for you. And uh, remember to uh, be careful out there. Don't text and drive. Arrive alive. And we'll see you next time here on The Focus Group. Take care. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.